Hello everyone and welcome to this DCS online tutorial of old school instrument flying and navigation. My name is Apache 600 and this tutorial is also being created in conjunction with my campaign The Museum Relic. It will help anyone with learning how to operate the systems in some of these old aircraft. Our main focus here today will be on aircraft without the fancy HUDs, heads up displays, and without VORs, GPSs, and INSs. What we'll do here is look at the good old steam gauges. Uh, it's a common misnomer because it's not actually steam, it's internal gyros and pitot-static systems that operate these. We'll also look at the wonderful world of NDBs. The topics we'll cover here today are radio setup, the basic on instrument flying and the importance of a good scan, NDB setup, NDB homing and common issues with it, and lastly, we'll shoot a made-up instrument approach with the NDB. Before we get started, I'd like to quick give you an aviation and flight sim background on myself. I first started flying simulators way back in the early 90s on an old 286. I was too young to really know what I was doing, but that sure didn't stop me. Titles like F-19 and Heroes of the 357th got me started. As time went on, I got into Gunship 2000, Team Apache, and Jane's World War II fighters. Eventually, IL-2 Sturmovik came out and its later 1946 add-on. I loved those titles, and they were my only flight sim for years. I didn't find DCS until about 2013, and had never really dabbled with anything quite like a study sim before this. But once I found it, I was hooked. I couldn't be happier either. It's an amazing sim. As for real-world flying, I started that back in 2006. Back then, NDBs were still functional across the United States, but the only thing I used them for was to tune in AM radio stations so I could listen to something while I was flying. Today, I now fly commercially with an Embraer E-175. I also hold a few flight instructor ratings, a CFI, CFII, and an MEI. So I do know a little bit about this topic. If you have any questions on the topics we'll cover today, feel free to ask as I'll only be able to do a very brief overview and can't really delve into the details in today's tutorial. Alright, let's move on. I'm assuming that those of you who are watching this video already know how to fly in at least VFR or some IFR. If not, there are plenty of documents and YouTube videos out there to help you get on your way. A couple of resources that I'd like to point out though, aside from the aircraft manuals that you can find in your DCS program files folder, are those written documents done by Charlie Owl, aka Chuck. He has done some absolutely amazing work and has simplified many of the features of the study sim aircraft. I highly recommend taking a look at his work. You can find a link to his forum posts in the descriptions below. Also, there's a community member out there named Lino. He has put together some excellent frequency maps. This is a must for anyone serious about this sim. You can find his link to his work below as well. I will be referring to his map uh, from time to time in this tutorial. Starting at the top of the topics list puts us at radio setup. The F-86 and MiG-15 vary a bit from each other in this area. Here we'll take a look at the F-86. I'm sitting on the ramp in Guadada and have just started the engine. In order to turn on the radio I need to select either TR or TR plus G, which stands for transmit receive or transmit receive and ground. However, the sim automatically implements the ground handling calls even with TR plus G not selected. Heck, the radio can even be off and it'll still work with talking to them. Next, I need to select the correct frequency or no one will hear me talking. If I call up on channel 1, I shouldn't receive any response because that's not the correct frequency. Goodada, in field, 1, 1. Request taxi to runway. But now looking at Lino's map here, I can see that Goodada is channel 6. Let's look at that and see if it works. Great, ATC can now yell at me. One quick note though, the F-86 can only select pre-selected frequencies. There's no coming up with a new frequency on the fly if it's not already loaded into the radio's database. In my campaign, The Museum Relic, I had to alter the default frequency selection. If we look back at Lino's map here, you'll see that Sochi doesn't have an F-86 selection. 
and this is an issue because we fly into Sochi in that campaign. So what you'll have to do is just pay a little closer attention to the mission briefings to see what's, uh, what frequency you'll need to select. The MiG-15 is a bit different than the F-86. To turn the radio on, all you need to do is make sure that the radio circuit breaker on the right side panel is in the on position. There's two different techniques you can use to select the frequencies. Both ways utilize the RSI 6K remote control. This unit switches both the transmit and receive functions at the same time. The first way is to spin the dial so that the, the desired number lines up with the index arrow. I'm currently here at MACOP, so looking at the MiG-15 ATC channel list, I see MACOP's wave number is 158. I'll dial that in and see if it works. Sakrat. Great. The second way is a bit more precise. Let's say I'm now halfway to Sochi and want to dial in their frequency. Looking at this list, their frequency number is 4.05. By pressing right shift and K, I bring up the kneeboard. Here I see the frequency that is active. With the kneeboard still up, I can spin the radio dial so that the numbers on the kneeboard match Sochi's frequency of 4.05. Now it's on to instrument flying. This is just a quick overview. You will absolutely have to practice this to become even slightly proficient. In the real world, you need 40 hours of just instrument training before you can go for your instrument rating check ride. I could talk to you about primary and supporting instruments for different aspects of the flight, but I'm not gonna do that because that would bore me to tears. I will just be discussing some of the basics to help you along and maybe give you a basis to work off of. Now the steam gauges are a bit different than what you'll find in the newer platforms in DCS. Unlike a HUD, where you have all of the most critical information displayed in the nice and easy to find location, your steam gauges are spread around in different places, different layouts, and the instruments all need a bit of attention to decipher what they're trying to tell you. I'll be flying the MiG-15 in this example since I feel that it is a little more difficult than the F-86 just because of instrument placement. Before I do that though, Notice how uh, notice here how the same essential instruments are put in different layout positions in the cockpit. The most important thing about instrument flying is having a good scan. You need to constantly be looking at the various instruments so you can better understand what your aircraft is doing. Stare too long at one and I guarantee the others will run wild. Example, if all I am looking at is trying to maintain 600 kilometers an hour, and I focus on the airspeed indicator, my altitude will most likely not be where I left it 10 seconds ago, and I'm sure my bank will probably have pulled me off into an undesired heading as well. Another major point that I want to bring up right now is that the VSI, or the vertical speed indicator, is not your friend. This instrument lags and therefore does not give you an instantaneous reading of climb or descent. It is better to look at the minute movement of the altimeter to gauge whether you are climbing or descending. Trust me on this, if you follow the VSI indication for trying to keep level, you will just be creating your own personal roller coaster in the sky. Here I wanted to maintain 4,900 meters, so I paid a little more attention to the altimeter than I did any of the other instruments, still keeping a scan going. You can see, after maintaining 4,900, my VSI came back into line. One thing I always need to make sure I do before entering the clouds is to turn on the pitot heat. What this does is heat up the tip of the pitot tube to an insanely hot temperature, preventing ice from being able to form over the tube and thus blocking the airflow into the system. Some modern day aircraft heat their probes up to around 350 degrees Fahrenheit. If ice were to block the airflow, you'd start getting false readings on your instruments. Obviously this is a potentially fatal issue since when you're flying in the clouds, all you have is your instruments to go off of. Sometimes recognize this issue can be simple, but other times it can be very difficult. Let's take the airspeed indicator for example. If just the tip of the inlet on the pitot tube iced over, the airspeed would show an indicated airspeed of zero. That's an easily recognized issue. 
But if both your inlet tube and the little drain hole on the pitot tube iced over, now the air inside the system is trapped, and your airspeed indicator will now act like an altimeter. This is not easily recognizable. As you climb higher, the outside air pressure decreases, but the pressure inside the pitot-static system stays where it was when the system froze over. So as you continue to climb, there is a higher and higher disparity between the stuck pressure and the outside pressure. This results in the system thinking that you're going faster and your speed indicator will read a faster speed. The opposite is true if you descend. The best way to combat this issue is to cross-check and compare your instruments to one another. Each instrument gives a clue as to what their fellow instruments are doing. In the case of the frozen pitot tube, if I kept the RPM the same, and I notice that I'm climbing at a thousand meters a minute, and my airspeed still increases, there's obviously someone in the group that's not telling the truth. There are also numerous issues that can happen with your altimeter and vertical speed indicator, as well as your attitude indicator if that isn't powered by your electrical system. Your attitude indicator operates off of gyros. If the gyro is spun by air, then after the system freezes over, the gyro will slowly start to spin down, and you'll see that the attitudes start uh, to indicate either a slow bank or a slow pitch change, or both. And after a while, it'll even show that you've been inverted or worse. This is a slow onset because the gyro is still spinning, just not as fast as it needs to be to show the correct attitude. Again, this is something that you can cross-check against other instruments, such as your bank indicator or your altimeter, to show whether or not that system has failed. Let's take a look at some basic IFR flying. I am constantly shifting my focus from instrument to instrument, never spending more than a second on each one. You can come up with a good pattern, but never leave out some of your other instruments. Your airspeed, and thus your altitude, will suffer if your RPM drops off because of engine failure due to low oil pressure. So make sure you look at everybody from time to time. In IFR, just as any cross-country flying, trim is your friend. Be sure to trim out your aircraft when you're at the speed and altitude you desire. Don't forget though, any power change will require you to retrim the elevator. Here you can see I'm climbing to my target altitude of 2,500 meters. I see my uh, vertical speed and pitch are fairly constant. Well, maybe not so much. And once I start nearing 2,500, I focus more on the altimeter and the attitude indicator. Remember, the VSI legs, so it's best not to use him for level off. Here I'm adjusting my power and trim to make holding altitude an easier task. I'm also on a heading of 060, and I want to change my course to 090, so I'll need to uh, turn right 30 degrees. As I initiate the right turn, you can see my VSI drops off a bit. With bank comes a loss in the total lift vector. Not all of the lift being produced on my wings are being redirected straight up. So, as I turn, all I really need to do is apply a little bit of back pressure to keep me from descending. I don't really need to apply power unless my bank is at a much further angle than it is now. Now this next bit is tricky. In level flight, 
I'm going to accelerate from 600 to 700 kilometers an hour. My altitude stays within 100 meters of target altitude, but I'm fighting the stick a bit as I'm looking for the proper trim setting. I'm also scanning my heading to make sure I'm still on my 090 heading. Okay, that was fun. Let's start a nice easy descent. I'll first reduce power and let the nose drop on its own. In IFR you never want to make any abrupt control inputs. I'm trying to maintain a 1500 meter a minute descent rate, but that can be difficult as my aircraft is also slowing. There we are, wings are still level, and a nice easy exit from the cloud layer. Okay, let's now look at NDB setups. NDBs, or non-directional beacons, are our only form of navigation in many of the older aircraft, aside from dead reckoning of course. In real life, NDBs were initially set up for maritime navigation. It was then adopted and used in aviation and served as a major source of navigation for many decades. The instrument is pretty straightforward. Dial in the correct frequency and the arrow will point in the direction of the NDB. Note that the instrument may have a fixed card background. If the dial is pointing in a direction of 080, this isn't a heading of 080. The fixed dial places the nose of your aircraft at 360 all the time. So you need to simply make a right turn 80 degrees. If your heading is 040 and the arrow is pointing to 080, then a heading of 120 will take you to the station. Let's hop in a plane and take a look. First, we'll have a look at the MiG-15. I'm here on the ground in Anapa. My plane is already running. In order to turn on the NDB, I need to make sure that the ARC-5 circuit breaker is on. Now I want to dial in the outer marker. Having a look at Lino's map here, I can see that the frequency for the outer marker is 443. I'm going to turn the radio compass mode selector over to comp or auto compass mode. From here, I need to switch this three-way position selector to the middle 310 to 640, since 443 is between those two values. From here, I'll spin the tuning handle so that 443 is under the center line. I'll know I have a good signal when the intens intensity indicator spikes to the right. I'll also be able to hear the Morse code identifier. Looking at Lino's map again, it should sound like a dot dash dash dot. And there we go. The needle has swung to point directly towards the outer marker. Now let's look at the F-86. I'm now at Seneki's ramp, sitting at idle power. When I flip the switch to the composition, nothing happens. This is because at idle power your generator isn't producing enough power for the ADF to turn on. So you'll need to bring up the power a bit before you can start using that system. I'll quickly set my parking brake and throttle, uh, throttle up a bit. Let's dial in Seneki's inner marker. Its frequency is 688. I'm going to select the four-way position to the range that allows 688. 
and then use the, turning, uh, the tuning handle to tune it in. Hmm, this is not nearly as easy to ID as the MiG-15 was. Let's bring up the kneeboard with right shift and K to get the frequency dialed in perfectly. There we go, 688. Listen for the Morse code to make sure we have the correct one. Excellent. Okay, the arrow is now pointing back and to my right. If I look over my shoulder, I should be able to see the station. And there it is. Let's quick taxi forward and see if the NDB will swing as I point the nose towards the station. Cool. That's the basics of how to set up the NDBs. Here we are at the NDB homing section. There really isn't all that much to discuss here because homing is all the instrument can really do. And I basically gave a perfect example of it a moment ago when we turned the F-86 towards the station while on the ground at Seneki. We can discuss a couple of different things, like what the effect of crosswind can do, and how to use NDBs to figure out where you are on a map. First of all, crosswind. In a perfect navigation world where there is no wind, you'll always end up flying a direct straight line to the NDB if the arrow is pointing straight off the nose. In actuality, that is rarely the case. You'll always have to crab a little degrees left or right of course and find the wind correction angle. That will then allow you to maintain a direct course towards the station. This diagram here illustrates it really well. Now finding out where you are on a map using NDBs requires one of two methods. The first method is the easy way, and that's to use cross radials. Here I am in the F-86, well above the clouds, and I don't have any idea what's below me. I have Nelchek's outer marker dialed in at 718. That only gives me one piece of the puzzle though. I now know I'm on this radio of Nelchek, but not sure where on that radial I am. If I bring up Beslin's outer marker on 1050, Now I have my radial picked out here as well. Simply plot the two lines and X marks the spot. Looks like I should be in the area of Mozdok. I'm going to press F10 and see if I'm right. Excellent. Doing that simple task gave me a good approximation of where I'm at. The other way to figure out your location is a bit more advanced. I'll fly the MiG-15 for this example. Say I only have one NDB, but need to figure out how far away from it I am. 
We'll need a stopwatch and a little bit of math work to figure this out. Thankfully, some people a lot smarter than I am have created a formula, and here it is. We first need to figure out time to station, and then with that, we can figure out distance to station. What you need to do is pick an airspeed and not deviate from it. I'm at a true airspeed here of 650 kilometers an hour, which will also be my ground speed in a no wind environment. Fly directly towards the station and then turn 90 degrees away and fly perpendicular to it. Here I am flying a heading of 360 towards the station. I'll need to turn left to a heading of 270 now. Let's start the stopwatch the moment the station is at a 90 degree deflection. And now we'll fly with the needle off our wing until it has moved 10 degrees from where you started your turn at. This could take a bit, so let's speed up the time here. Okay, there we are. 10 degrees in about 89 seconds. Let's do the math. 89 seconds divided by 10 degrees equals 8.9. So that means I should reach the station in just about 9 minutes if I turn back towards it right now. The next part of the equation calls for us to take that 8.9 minutes and multiply it by our speed of 650 kilometers an hour. That equals 5,785. Now divide that by 60 and you'll get 96.4. So our distance from the station is about 96.4 kilometers. Let's take a look at the F-10 map and see how close I am. Okay, 104 kilometers. That's pretty close considering there's a lot of room for error in the way of approximations in figuring out these numbers. We finally made it to the last section of the tutorial, the NDB approach. This is where we put all of the previous elements together. We're going to use the approach from Mission 4 of the Museum Relic Campaign. Here we have the NDB approach to Runway 6 at Sochi. Let's take a look at the approach plate. In the top right, we can see that we need the frequency of 4.05 MHz. And that the NDB should be tuned in for 761 MHz. Looking at the NDB procedure in the bottom right, it says we should fly the approach at 450 km an hour. We'll overfly the NDB at 1000 meters and then proceed outbound from the station on a heading of 240. We should have the NDB arrow pointed at or around the 180 mark on the compass card when we're doing this. We fly this heading for one minute. Once one minute is up, we'll start our teardrop turn, turning to a heading of 210 for 30 seconds. After the 30 seconds is up, we'll start a right 180 degree turn to a heading of 030. On this heading of 030, we'll fly straight ahead until the NDB arrow is also pointing at 030 on its compass card. Once the arrow hits 030, we'll turn inbound on the final approach course. We should see our heading of 060, and the NDB arrow should be pointing straight ahead to 360 or 0. We'll now descend to our minimum descent altitude of 300 meters. If at 300 meters, and we fly the course all the way to the NDB and past the station while never seeing the airport, then we'll execute the missed approach by climbing to 2000 meters and turning left to a heading of 090. Alright, so I've positioned my aircraft to the north of Sochi. I'm going to be descending into the clouds. So let's make sure that my pitot heat is on. Now let me check to make sure that I've got the correct radio and NDB frequencies inputted in.
Okay, I've also got the NDB Morse code identified. Let's turn that volume down and then call up approach and get a clearance. I'm going to turn on some of the instrument lights here just so I can see the instruments a little better once we get into the clouds. Okay, I'm heading towards the NDB and descending to a thousand meters. I'm going to make sure that my RPM does not drop too low and kick off the generator. We don't want any power hiccups that could affect the pitot heat. Once I overfly the NDB, I'm going to have a couple of indications telling me that I've done so. One of the indications is going to be that the NDB uh, index arrow is going to swing from 0 to 180. You're going to see it start swinging wildly. Another thing is I'm going to get that marker red light and the, uh, the bell alarm saying that I'm over the top of the NDB. Alright, I've desc descended to a thousand meters, and I'm letting the aircraft slow to 450 kilometers an hour. Kind of tricky because remember, as I slow, the, air the aircraft is going to want to pitch down, so I'm going to have to trim back a little bit and make sure that I keep my altitude kind of where I want it. Okay, there's the indication that I'm over the top of the marker, and here's my right turn heading 240. As I did this turn here, I pitched up a little bit and my speed bled off. I'm going to pick up the power a bit and correct that. If I get too slow, I definitely do not want to stall while in IMC. Alright, got the speed and altitude back under control. There's 240 on the heading and I'm going to start my timer. Now because I fluctuated so much on my speed, I'm having a hard time figuring out my trim here. I'm a little low so I'm trying to correct my altitude bringing it back up. I don't want to do it too aggressively and bleed off all that speed again. I am really wrestling with my altitude here. This is embarrassing. I'm going to adjust the attitude indicator here. I think that's what uh, caused some of these problems. I was referring to that, and it always showed me about level, but I was actually nose low. So I'm going to adjust it up a bit here. Okay, there's one minute. I'm going to start my left turn heading 210 for the beginning of the procedure turn. Okay, once I roll wings level, I'm going to take a look at the clock and see where it's at.
All right, that's about 30 seconds. Let's start the right 180 degree turn back to a heading of 030. I'm doing this turn a little more aggressively just because I don't want to overshoot my inbound course. There we go, a heading of 030, I'm going to roll the wings level and wait for the NDB arrow to also point at 030. Once it's there, I know I'll be on the 060 inbound course and I'll turn towards the NDB pointer. You don't want to forget to keep that scan up. Looks like I'm pretty good with my speed and altitude. Heading is still 030, and there we are, NDB 030. Let's turn to the right, heading 060. That should put the NDB pointer at 360 or 0. All right, wings level, and that looks right on. I should be on the inbound course. The airport should be right off my nose. I'm going to drop the flaps. This is kind of difficult because there's a huge pitch up motion once you drop your flaps and in IFR you can't tell what's actually going on visually. So once I hit that flaps I'm also going to start trimming the nose down just to catch the nose from climbing too much. All right, I'm going to start my descent now down to 300 meters, which is the minimum descent altitude or MDA on this approach. Bring the landing gear down. All right, starting to break out of the cloud layer, and well, check that out. There's Sochi. Sochi, сто первый, разрешите посадку. Один ноль один, Сочи, посадку разрешаю. Посадочный ноль шесть. All right, that there is the NDB approach. A little sloppy in the beginning, but even with those couple mistakes that I had made trying to correct my altitude and speed, I was able to put it back together and end up on a pretty nice inbound course right into the runway. This concludes the tutorial. Thanks for watching. I hope that you learned something from it and that you'll be able to apply some of the new knowledge to flying and navigating the MiG-15 and or the F-86. If you have any questions on any of the content, feel free to ask. I'm just going to finish up this approach and land the airplane. If you'd like some pointers on speeds and sight pictures, just keep it tuned here for a bit longer and watch the landing.
1-0-1. Заруживайте на стоянку. 